People are still trickling in. Welcome, everyone. It's a real pleasure to have James Wines of Sight with us this evening. And I'm really thrilled he has accepted our invitation to be here tonight. It is fair to say that James Wines and his practice Sight are having a significant moment. Everywhere you go, James and Sight's work is there, being talked about and rediscovered by a new generation of architects. This is, of course, the most important form of recognition that can happen to an architect. Not the recognition received as the work is being produced, but rather the one that emerges many years and even decades later. Then, not only is the work recognized for its lasting influence and understood as ahead of its time in the positions it's put forth, but it is, but it is also able to be received as continuous and consistent across time forming a solid body of work carried from project to project and from project to the field with legible resonances produced across it. Today we recognize James' work as seminal in many different ways. First, Sight's most revered early projects, the series of showrooms the practice designed for the best stores, registered the postmodern interests of its time alongside other architects such as Venturi Scott Brown in particular, with whom Sight joined forces in enlisting architecture's ability to engage the ordinary as well as embrace its capacity to communicate. But beyond this, and in a more radical way, Sight's work was unique in tying architecture to the environmental art practices of the time while also mobilizing so openly and polemically architecture in and as a constant critique of itself. In 1987, Wines publishes The Architecture, in which he traces a new triangle of exchanges between art, architecture, and environment, redefining each in relation to the other, and articulating a burgeoning scene of artists and architects who were together offering an alternate to the canonical and mostly formal concerns of both art and architecture at the time. Through figures and friends, such as Emilio Ambas, Vito, Vito Aconci, Anne Farm, Nancy Holt, Mary Miss, Gaetano Pesce, Gordon Mata Clark, Jani Petenia, and Robert Smithson, amongst others, Wines renders visible approaches to more formless, conceptual, and critical art and architectural practices, which were also often refreshingly playful, witty, and always operating beyond the safe and stable boundaries of the disciplines they were recasting. Wines' pioneering concerns with architecture's environmental dimension led to a prolific body of work that brought architecture and landscape, density and ecology, infrastructure, public space, and public art together well ahead of its time. In 1977, Site designs its ghost parking lot, still one of the most radical intersections of public infrastructure, public art, and architecture to this day. In 1981, at the height of postmodern obsessions with historicist references, Site proposes its high-rise of homes, filling the Corbusian concrete frame with a stack of suburban homes and lawns. The practice's 1983 Frankfurt Museum of Art juxtaposes vertical landscape and building well before such integration of green as a material for architecture became du jour. And in the early 90s, as formal and digital blob obsessions proliferate, with many incubated at this school, Site radically reimagines ecology, infrastructure, and architecture with a series of urban interventions, such as the Avenue 5 Central Plaza and water buildings for the 1992 Seville World Expo, or the Ross's Landing Park and Plaza built that same year. Wines' built work lives along his prolific writing. In the early 70s, Wines launches a series of publications entitled On Site, with topics such as energy for its sixth issue. In 2000, Wines publishes one of the first books defining the idea of green architecture. And in 2005, the practice publishes its monograph entitled Identity and Density, with essays by Michael McDonough, amongst others. James Wines is the former chairman of environmental design at Parkinson Schools of Design and currently professor of architecture at Penn State University. During the past decades, 22 monographic books and museum catalogs have explored Site's body of work. 
Wines has been recognized extensively, including with the 1995 Chrysler Award for Design Innovation and the 2013 National Design Award for Lifetime Achievement. His pioneer, pioneering forays into the radical possibilities afforded by integrating art, architecture, and the natural environment continues to today with increasing resonance and power. Tonight's response will be given by Andres Haki, who needs no introduction, and whose own practices, re practices reimagining of architecture, infrastructure, and environment is producing groundbreaking and inspiring work, as well as Prem Krishna Murth. Krishna Murthy, sorry, whose multi-pronged practice as a designer, creator, educator, and writer, best known recently, or at least over the past five years, for the inspiring creative forays he has led through his art gallery P, is reshaping the design fields in fresh and important ways. But first, please join me in welcoming James Wines and Sight. <laughs> Good heavens, this is this challenge that one rarely gets, is where that the introduction is far more articulate than the lecture. <laughs> so bear with me after that. I, I, I thank Amal profusely uh, for that introduction. Uh, I, I hardly know what to, where to start here. <clears throat> and, and anyway, uh, actually this is a, a kind of a humorous event and an epic event because um, the reason I think I'm here is actually I confided in Amal that I've lectured in 57 countries, but I've never been invited to Colombia. And uh, that's not completely true because uh, I think I was invited to a, um, I, I think a drawing symposium uh, in 1987. I think, I think I was actually, I was here once, but never since. And uh, it, it's amusing because uh, it's, it became a kind of comedy routine in my office because I did get an awful lot of lectures over the years, almost a thousand, I think. And but every time I, I would have a lecture, I don't know, I, one I think it was a king and queen of Spain summoned me to talk about Gaudi and Barcelona, and I that needless, I was really impressed. And so I would I announce it to my office, and they said. And they said, well, yeah, yeah, that's impressive, but, but it's not Columbia. <laughs> so, you can imagine how I feel tonight. I'm absolutely breathless uh, in anticipation uh, of what I can do and what I can say here. Um, the, the, the first thing that I, I think is very important, though, in, in talking about this in general is that it is important to have open dialogue. Uh, you know, I've been on lecture committees, so I know how they work sometimes. And they can be faithful because, you know, if you're the subject of some controversy, whatever that is, and your name comes up at the lecture committee and somebody condemns you, you're condemned for life. You know, and, and there's always two reasons. Either you're, you're not invited because you couldn't possibly have anything to say of any value to the institution. Or the other one is, um, you know, you don't want that person to come because they will taint the delicate minds of our students. <laughs> and so here I am uh, uh, tainting, but, uh, but you're off the hook, by the way. I'm sure I'm the oldest person in this room tonight. And as the oldest person, anything I say tonight you can attribute to senility. <laughs> so, so, you know, you know, even if I say something offensive, you, you're off the hook. You just, you just relax, everybody. You can say, you know, the mind is going. You know, it's going fast. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, let's start. Uh, first of all, I want to dedicate tonight's uh, program to a lifelong friend, really, one of my greatest friends, and a much admired genius of art and architecture, uh, Vito Acconci. Um, actually, he got a lecture at Columbia, and so I <laughs> harbored this envy for my whole, of both of our whole lives. Well, you got invited. But anyway, he is an extraordinary figure, and if there's anybody in this audience who doesn't know who Vito Acconci is, look him up immediately when you, because I know there's not a lot of communication between art and architecture having been in academia myself. 
Uh, but he is really exceptional and, and bridges the gaps between the two. Okay, uh, all right, let's talk kind of about today. And my subject tonight is really communication. Actually, it's two subjects. One, I'm gonna talk about a subject that really has concerned me my whole life, what is public communication? And the other, since I say, since I have never been invited to speak here, I'm gonna kind of give you an, an overview, a quick you know, smash overview of what site does and kind of where we, what we've done, but also, you know, things that I think that still have relevance to the, to the future. Uh, you look at this picture, you can start to see the problem. Uh, on one hand, there's high level communication, which is the cell phone, and there's the other interpretation for high level communication, which is the, you know, crowd scene of the public space. Now, we, we clearly have, have a problem with, with, with this level of communication. It's dominating the world, it's dominating what we actually call communication. And it, is, it isn't always really successful. I mean, you know, we all get, we're all part of the social network, so we get it every day and we're deluged with it. And it doesn't always give us the information we really want to receive. I mean, you know, I mean, this is a typical day on my, my Instagram. <laughs> And, uh, and I mean, look at it, you get, you get kind of amateur pornography, you get people who want to take their clothes off that you least want to see the, their clothes off. Uh, you have, at the top, that's a photo of shit. Uh, and, and then there's, you know, but all sorts of things that aren't really very, very important, that, that aren't either probably worth communicating or that you really don't want to see. And this is, of course, you know, we had this one, which is really a problem. And then you have the interpretation of the public domain, which extends this discontent to the street. So this, the actual public domain itself is used for constant agendas and constant protests. And uh, it's, it's rather than a place of necessarily of a, a communion and friendliness, it's a comparison of you know, all kinds of conflicts. And then there's the ultimate vehicle of the agenda, which is the T-shirt. You know, you have the agenda of the T-shirt itself. People literally wear their, their ideas on their bodies. I, I, I'm particularly, you know, in, sort of encouraged by the one at the bottom right. Fat people are hard to kidnap. So I, I, <laughs> I find that, you know, invigorating. Ah. Uh, but then there's tattoos, tattoos where you actually inscribe your body with your agenda, which I find very heartening. I, I wish, you, you know, uh, I, I've been a fan of the Suicide Girls for some time, and I always kind of wish to see more of them on architecture crits. They would liven things up, to say the least. But then there's a, there's a real problem. I, uh, you know, Baudrillard uh, identified simulacra, where the simulated is far more real than the real. But that's true of celebrity, uh, where the simulation, where the media saturation has created a situation that's staggering in its, in its implication. I mean, here's the People magazine of the air says the sexiest man in the world. But this is merely an icon. You, we don't know this person. We, we, we see them completely as a media fabrication. And I would imagine, you know, it must feel good, you know, like Brad Pitt, you know, wakes up in the morning and is the editor of People magazine and you've just been selected as the sexiest man in the world. And I'd imagine there's a certain heady euphoria when you get the nomination. But then on the other hand, I think of poor Brad Pitt. I mean, this means that Brad Pitt, for the rest of his life, every time he goes to bed with a woman, she's sitting there with a sardonic expression on her face saying, okay, big boy, show me. And, you know, no wonder Brad Pitt is an alcoholic. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a cue for instant impotence if there ever was one. All right, let's get into the meat of this problem, social and political commentary. And to what degree does the public domain, does architecture and public art or public space have to do with it? Is there a role at all? Certainly in graphics there's a role. I mean, some of the most powerful graphics in the world, you know, Goya in particular, uh, communicated very, very controversial and sardonic messages through, through, through graphics. Um, it, you know, it led the, the, the German expressionists, it, it, it led 
up to the present day, whether it's, uh, you know, Caddy Colwitz or Otto Dix or uh, ending up here with uh, an anti-AIDS poster by, by Keith Herring, it, it, graphics have always been approved in a sense, or, or, or it's been uh, accepted that a graphic representation can take on a political cause. In this case, <coughs> I never, <coughs> excuse me, really completely understood um, Charlie Hebdo. I always thought their covers were a little bit adolescent in their content, but uh, it offended an awful lot of people in the Muslim world, and obviously there was a terrorist attack. And so one has to take graphic representation very, very seriously. I've done a few controversial things of my own. We did a, a, a kind of an, a commentary on the Ville Radieurs, which was really blackened uh, uh, store mannequins you know, in a, a cargo net full of oil dripping into a pan for the Venice Biennale. And, uh, and even the drawings were reproduced very, very frequently because it, 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 you know, it's, it was not exactly what Le Corbusier envisioned when he thought of the Ville Radieuse. And I've done controversial posters. This was the request of the, I think, the uh, uh, Cooper Hewitt to do something about the Statue of Liberty, and that was the time of of uh, nuclear proliferation. I did the one more recently for uh, anti, sort of an anti-Trump because at one time I know Trump was going to do landfill in lower Manhattan. And uh, so this is the ultimate, ultimate Trumpian landfill where you actually fill in the Chatsua Liberty. So her, only her torch becomes the plaza. So this gets into this whole territory we call controversy. And I, and I asked the question really tonight, uh, what role does architecture play? Now, one thing that's very interesting about America, and you certainly see it up to the, up to the last moment in, in the news, is the, the most sensible element of all American culture is nudity. God forbid nudity. Everything else is secondary to the human body in terms of the censored image. I mean, you know, you, what is it? Guns kill uh, 33,000 people and injure 80,000 a year, and yet guns are celebrated. We're, we're going through that right now in, in our, in, on television every night. <clears throat> and the, the Trumpian constituencies obviously are, are huge advocates of, of the sensibility. But what's censored is very interestingly enough, the, the body. And I, I found this true, even, even I have had problems in, in, in the university environment because um, I've made drawing. One time I was trying to demonstrate how, how vapid and, and, and sort of uh, cold and, and, and unappealing uh, SketchUp was at drawing the human body, and I could do it with much more vitality. This was actually a, a, a greeting card or actually an invitation to a friend in Florence. Was, he wanted to give a Roman orgy party, so I did the invitation for him. And I've done other things. I, I started studying illustrations for, uh, this is the ravaging of Lady Curagonde, and, and I was going to do Candide illustrations. And, and then I, even with students, I had a figure drawing class that I thought would almost shut down the university at Penn State. Uh, because I was showing, you know, the transformation of the human body. Like you could take the, I mean, did some sketches from the model, and then I showed that they, you could, you know, do, go through the mental transformation part and use something like Hong Kong to become the, the body itself. But anyway, what I, I want to really say, one thing tonight, it's very, very, very important, it certainly is young architects or designers or artists, that if you don't understand the human body in its entirety, including psychologically and physically and visually and space, orientation-wise, in every respect, I don't think you can possibly practice architecture in particular or any art form. I think understanding the human body is, as starting with Vitruvius onward, has been there at the core of everything that we do. So that is a very important message I want to convey tonight, because that is important. And, and if you identify every period of history, we instantly recognize the periods of history which are being illustrated by these great works of art, uh, you know, which are primarily centered around depiction of the human body. So I have two favorite phrases I put into every lecture because I think that they qualify for anything you, as an artist or architect, would like to do. 
One is from Oscar Wilde, an idea that is not dangerous is unworthy of being called an idea at all. And the second is William Burroughs, artists are to my mind the real architects of change and not the pol political legislators who implement change after the fact. And certainly the times in which we live in are clear evidence of both of this problems. Uh, when you think of revolution, you think of obviously the Demselles d'Avignon, which is certainly at the time, or even today, not an attractive painting. But from Picasso's perspective, where he, his whole life was shaped around Renaissance perspective and Renaissance realistic depiction, or Baroque depiction, uh, to change those perspectives, to the foreground and the background, and the, to have transparent figures and juxtapositions of space of this kind were revolutionary and took a lot of courage to do. Marcel Duchamp, mustache on the Mona Lisa. Again, an extraordinary moment in time where you take, take a sacred icon and just change one small element and arouse an awful lot of controversy. Um, the, uh, by the way, uh, is there any way to uh, justify these are all coming out very thin. Can we can we um, widen the frame a little bit? Is there a way of widening the frame? This I'm, I'm, this is technology here. You guys be very helpful. These are all slimming out the artworks, and there's nothing that annoys me more than. Is it okay up there? Well, is it all right? Because on my screen it's looking very compressed. Well, okay. Okay. But anyway, uh, you know, basically I wanted to talk about the human body and, 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 it's, and, and the visionaries who have used the human bodies in multiple ways, um, certainly through surrealism. Jackson Pollock, I mean, the entire gestural strategy of Pollock's painting was that into the painting you had to read his actions in doing the painting. So as action painting, the action became part of the visual experience, the residual of that experience. So there are incredibly un imaginative and important ways in which the human body has evidence. You know, Eve Klein jumping out into space, you know, the idea of suspension, the idea of danger, uh, the, you know, changing the art gallery. Uh, uh, Alan Capro in the 60s, you know, filled art galleries full of, of debris and, in this case, tires. So rather than be able to easily navigate the gallery, your body was compelled to re-navigate re the body in a completely different way. Vito Acconci, of course, my hero, uh, did these amazing body works in, in the 60s. The, the, the amu most amusing one was the following, where he, he would pick a person, just a random person, and follow them all day long. So you can imagine the, the annoyance of having this kind of familiar person appear in your lobby and then at your lunch table, and he follows you through the whole day. And then uh, Vito also did kind of um, body, uh, body extension projects, like jumping up on a, on a stool 30 times in a row and to see how many times he could do it. So these are actually experimenting with the limits of identity in the, in the public domain and the limits of the body to capacity to, to exercise or, to, or to, to, do, to jump and change and walk and, 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 and other, other aspects. Uh, this is a, another, this is um, Kusama using the human body, nudity as a protest uh, element. You know, she did this whole period uh, of pieces called Love Forever, where she got a, a group of nude dancers to appear on <coughs> Uh, as anti-war statements uh, throughout New York on bridges and monuments and so forth. Then uh, a period that I had to experience directly because my daughter was 14 years old and a, and a, a punk advocate at that age, so I had to go to CBGB's with her every other night uh, as the oldest, obviously, participant in that scene. Uh, but I really did get to know all the, all the rockers that, that that appeared. I mean, I, I really, I'm mean, one of the very few parents of that age who knew the Clash and the Ramones and the Dead Boys and the Dead Kennedys and the Buzzcocks and the so forth and the Stooges. So I was one of the very few who were articulate in that territory. But again, it was very much involving engaging the human body in the rock experience. And then as a brilliant example of utilizing the Guggenheim Museum, probably one of the best ever, was the Kraymaster cycle by Matthew Barney, who you know 
really use video and actual performers to engage you as a spectator in the one thing that's never quite worked in the Guggenheim, which is the ramps. I mean, most, I, I, I guess, you know, there have been a few exhibitions like Alexander Calder that looked good in the space, but most exhibitions are either cramped or destroyed by the insistence of the architecture. And in this case, uh, Matthew Barney used it magnificently. Well, let's talk a little bit now got into the messages communicated by architecture in public space. Oh, is that wider? Is it, is it wider now? No. So maybe so. Yeah, it looks, it looks normal again. Okay, well, having lived in Italy for a long period of my life, uh, my acceptance of what constituted public space, uh, especially when I got back to America and witnessed what was going on here, I mean, the, the gap between the Piazza Navona and uh, the Millennium Park in Chicago was just like living in two different worlds. Uh, you know, everything about the Piazza Navona invites participation and everything about the Millennium Park Plaza repels it. So, you know, you're a little ant in one and you're an actually human being communicating in the other. We'll talk about this as we go along. But uh, let's talk about the ability of architecture to communicate. I mean, the temples of India, starting about 900, were really lessons in eroticism. You could actually use sculpturally the erotic act. It was instructive to human happiness. It was an instructive element of architecture. Now, you don't find much of this around Manhattan these days, that's for sure. But uh, the power of, of using the most important act of human procreation as the iconography of a, of a, of a, of a building is, is very progressive. You know, it, it got a little bit more cleaned up when, when Christianity came into play, but it was still the iconography. It wasn't, it wasn't eroticism, but there was a, certainly a lot of controversial content that could be applied to building. You could, you know, if you didn't like your bishop, you could carve him into purgatory right on the facade of the cathedral. So there was an awful lot of caricature, an awful lot of use of architecture itself to communicate public messages. Uh, it began to fade a little. When you look at um, places like Orvieto or, or Siena cathedrals, you realize that the iconography was richly endowed by the fact that it was really relevant. It was part of the culture, it was part of the religion, it was very much a part of public life. By the time you got to the uh, Garnier uh, Opera Nationale, it, it faded. I mean, the iconography was there, it, it, the, the articulation was there, the actually substance of the, the raw material, the content was missing. It became weaker and weaker. There was a gradual loss because you're also losing uh, religious and civic messages and you were losing the patrons. I mean, what was happening is that the world was shifting to the industrial age and so the ideal, ideal and idealism was contained within industrial materials, industrial practices, the liberation of, of, of political life, you, the shorter workday, uh, the new socialism, it, it was embodied in different kinds of messages. So the old opera house began to look rather old and fusty, whereas the Spartan vocabulary of the industrial plant, the industrial image of the 21st, 20th century began to look very appealing. Actually, it's the turn of the 19th century. So when Corbusier talked about, you know, machines for living in, he, re he really meant that you could create a sculptural dynamic. You, you would strip the sculptured iconography off the building and you would have this powerful image, obviously drawing on the, on the, on the revolutions of Cubism, but you could, you could actually make a building that was almost had the same language of a combustion engine. It was, it was energetic in itself. So things began to change rapidly. And the major thing that changed, and Corbusier is, Corbusier is of course, acknowledged as the, the pioneer of this idea, is that you could remove um, political and religious sculptural iconography in the building. You could take it away because it was something that always was brought to the building from the society, and the entire good building could become a sculpture in itself. And of course, almost everything in architecture since that time 
has been built on this premise. Still to this day, though, uh, certainly the, uh, you know, Ronchamp Chapel is one of the greatest sculpture, sculpture as architecture buildings. Well, anyway, this, you know, distancing oneself from history became an obsession, even with Corbusier, who wanted to, you know, kind of redevelop Paris with these giant phallic towers and great slabs of concrete. And notice there are little fluffs of vegetation in the fore foreground, but everything is really dedicated to the slab, the upward slab and the horizontal slab. And so the Voisin plan, fortunately, didn't get built. The old Paris is still there. But you can see where the incentive was moving. It was very, very powerful. And of course, it moved into almost all of the movements of the early 20th century, whether it was Cubism or constructivism or whatever. I mean, it became evident that the messages being carried by buildings and spaces were changing radically. So long lost, I mean, I have that little bit of the RVA Cathedral on the, up in the corner, but you can certainly see in the, in, in, in the work of Chernikov and Melnikov and, and the Russians, uh, the idea was to celebrate technology, celebrate the building process. That became very important. Now, one thing I caution you, because I, I'm going to be critical of this, I mean, this idea of celebrating the construction process has been around for over 100 years. It started in the late 1800s, and as an idea, or as a point of view, or as a premise for creativity, it's been around an awful long time. So, and it's, it proliferates every, every, you know, city in the world is based on the same paradigm. I mean, they just got taller and taller and taller. I always have a feeling that there's an awful lot of developers who feel under-endowed, so they're going to show their erections by going higher and higher and higher and higher. So all cities are, are, are evidence of, the, of this discontent with one's body, I assume. But, I mean, this is really a, a, a winner. This is Robert Moses' vision of Crosstown Expressway. This is where I live in the corner of Broom and Green for 1961, fortunately defeated by the energies of Jane Jacobs and others, but thank God Broom Street, as we know it, is saved, and that's the, all the lessons of light and shadow and articulation of space and scale references are still there, as opposed to what Robert Moses was going to impose on the city. But it, things did get imposed on the city, even with the tragedy of, of 9-11, you, ha you have to admit that only two years before there was a cover story on the um, um, New, York, New York Magazine that the World Trade Center and its plaza was the most hated buildings in New York. And then two years later, they were selected by terrorists as symbols of, I guess, economic wealth or whatever and, and destroyed and then resurrected in the exact iconography of the originals. I mean, the, the message is still the same. The message is the grandeur of vast amounts of wealth and, and, and ground coverage of vertical and horizontal ground coverage of steel and concrete. So we still have the same paradigms. Now the diversion, of course, we have you know, the, the, the great star architects of our time, but the diversion is highly sculptural. It's, it's basically sculpture as architecture. So it's, it, it harkens back to Corbusier's uh, reinvention of iconography on buildings. But uh, part of the problem here is, is part of the problem here is that the buildings are the big event. And as a spectator, you're standing on the pedestal or next to the pedestal. So the space around is, in a sense, carries no message, whereas the building carries the entire message. So this is another change. And then you get manifestations like this, which is, you know, La, La Défense in Paris, where people on the street, the actual occupants of the space, are just merely little ants crawling around. And so you have to contrast it. I mean, just contrasting with my life in Italy to La Défense. Now, the big criticism immediately jumps to mind. Is, oh, James Wise is just hearkening back with nostalgia to tradition. Well, that's not true because every single thing in this picture is as relevant today as it ever was. Scale reference, human scale reference. Quality of materials, light and shadow being used to maximum advantage. 
water, elevation. People love to be at higher and lower elevations to look at each other. Thousands of choices of things to sit on. None of those elements of the pleasures or the messages of public space have disappeared. All that's changed is the sources of, of, of imagery or the sources of influence. So you can take everything in this picture and it's as progressive as anything you could possibly think of. And so, you know, again, we just look at a picture like this, which I'm you know, being a little bit facetious here by putting the Trevi Fountain in the middle. The Trevi Fountain attracts something like 70 million visitors a year for sheer enjoyment of the space. And I seriously doubt that any of these other New York spaces attract anywhere near that level of traffic, human traffic. So we do have a problem. We do have a problem of communication and what we're communicating. Now one of them, and again, I'm being facetious here. This is just one of my, you know, is to say, you're not gonna be offended. Nobody has to be offended. You can always bring, blame my senility. But anyway, this is a illustration I, I, I use in a lecture sometimes because the, the compulsion of architects to sculpturally design is often at the deficit of the thing itself. The teacup is a masterpiece as it is. It's perfectly functional, it's beautiful, it's gracious, it's, we've had it for probably thousands of years. You don't really need to do anything to it. Now an artist looking at this problem would look at it and say, well, it, it probably could use some kind of psychological transformation. So in the hands of Merritt Oppenheim, there is a psychological transformation. That's an art, art experience, a clearly well understood art experience. Now, uh, obviously, Merritt Oppenheim was, was, was a genius, and she thought of this amazing image, which is one of the pinnacle works at, at MoMA of, of surrealist Dadaist art. Uh, but my contention is, you know, given the kind of architecture scene today, <clears throat> if you took this same object and you sent it to, you know, sort of five official design or, you know, very successful design offices, uh, the first thing they would do, they'd be horrified, and they'd, first of all, they would shave it, and then they would redesign it. And uh, the idea of imposing design on everything is also not necessarily the best way to communicate. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about sites work, which you can just see from the texture on the screen. Uh, there is a different point of view. We've had a different point of view. Uh, and the different point of view comes from looking at architecture as a kind of subject matter. Uh, I put these words on the screen because I tried to kind of sum up because people have been asking me a lot recently for what did you mean by that. So I've been putting it on there. And one of them is the process of doing things. The content is in the process, which is interesting. Architecture as a critique of itself making buildings that actually, you know, are anti-buildings or buildings as critiques. Architecture as a subject matter for art rather than the primary objective of design. And then idea, attitude, and context as forms, versus form, space, and structure. Now everything has form, space, and structure. Uh, but idea, attitude, and context are more ephemeral and more mysterious. Uh, I think it was Duchamp who said, well, you know, I, I, I don't like to do retinal things. That didn't mean that he couldn't see them. He just was that interested in traditional painting and sculpture that he wanted to find another way to interpret visual art. Then we found a lot of words that, that we felt were not necessarily part of the mainstream of architectural dialogue or discourse. Melted, mobilized, diffused, displaced, buried, floated, and everything. And over the years, in terms of creating objects or, or buildings or spaces, we started using them. I mean, we melted you know, we did melted candlesticks, melted buildings, cascaded, mobilized, buildings that moved, reflected, diffused, consumed, displaced, floated, morphed, buried, inverted, peeled, fragmented, ghosted, exposed, dematerialized, cracked, and collaged. And in basically the motivations were guided by something very conservative. I'll, quite, I'll tell you quite frankly that I, as a sculptor, I was kind of a doggedly constructivist influenced sculptor. So I was, you know, crafting big steel and concrete 
uh, works when I first started my career, and actually I was pretty successful at it. I did a lot of so-called public art, which I now call plop art. <coughs> but when I got into architecture, I, I began to realize that the real power is, is in familiarity. Everybody knows what certain skyscrapers look like. Everybody knows what a bank building should look like. Everybody knows what certain kinds of suburban houses or, or, or desert houses look like. Everybody knows what fast food restaurants look like. And everyone knows what you know, big box shopping centers look like. So these, this iconography, these paradigms, carry with them a lot of terms of recognition, which are really important. So we started in the big box world, which was uh, actually this particular big box group was owned by great collectors of contemporary art, mainly pop art, but collectors of contemporary art. And uh, so they were very sophisticated and you needed somebody sophisticated. In fact, all of our first clients, I'll have to tell you quite honestly, were art, art collectors. <clears throat> because I graciously sort of came from the art world, but then I kind of moved into architecture, so they sort of understood that something could be controversial or different or whatever. So it's starting with this big box world, um, and it's always the same. The way it, they're interpreted even to this present day, if you want to gain attention for Best Buy or Walmart, you paint it a nice color, or you enlarge the graphics, or there are a bunch of conventions which everyone uses. And so in a way, it's good to keep the conventions because everybody knows what they are. But when site first started, we completely inverted that meaning. And it was interesting because on the day that we opened this building in Texas, it was in 1975, the same day, Architectural Record came out with a big article, I think it was Cesar Pelle's Orbox, as the cutting edge of shopping center design. And they had everything. It had a new logo, a beautiful logo, and better graphics. It had a, an aluminum trim. It had, you know, bright colors. It had better, better everything. Uh, but the one thing it did not have is, is a, you know, a controversial content. It didn't, it wasn't talking about anything. And uh, so this building opened to obviously great controversy. I mean, it, it, it did not please the architectural record or any official magazines in the beginning. Uh, it was actually loved, beloved by the Blick Dayer. They asked him, what are you going to do after this? And he said, I'm going to retire because I can't go back to the old way. So it was a, it, 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 it communicated. For whatever reason, you know, nobody has to understand it, it communicated. And actually, as time went on, over the first year or so, it communicated vastly. It was often used in, in, in Articles, for example, on, on social change or protest, it was often used on, on to describe the decline or ascent of the prime rate on Wall Street. So that the fragmentation idea, for whatever reason, communicated something other than design or form was being communicated. But it was interesting that there was a big article in Architectural Record, which I really loved. This was the, they published the, the Houston building, and this was the, issue following that, and I, I have to read some of these, these are just absolutely wonderful. Of particular interest was Gerald Allen's mention of the power of the juxtaposition of the modestly familiar, familiar with the stunningly unfamiliar. This is precisely the root of Dio Hebb's theory of fear. I read with disbelief that article about the best products company buildings and wish to head the list of readers that object vehemently against such atrocities and abominations presented in the name of humor, environmental response, and a humanizing of building. This is an affront to human dignity and an insult to architectural innovation, decadent, but these are just other words that came out, decadent potential, sinister sense of humor, backdoor values, sheer lunacy, and tailor-made to incite the anarchistic tendencies of my, our society. And that was the beginning of my career. So, you know, as a, as a young creative person, you, you prefer not to have this on your first the first response. Uh, also, there were an awful lot of letters to the editor, cancel my subscription. So, you know, architectural rush were lost out. Well, then I have to talk a little bit about meaning and reaction and everything. Then you start gaining friends. So, the first wave of friends talks about, oh, you know, this is about architecture and ruin. I know what this is all about. You know, James, it's all about ruin and destruction and 
and the downfall of the Western world. <clears throat> and I always said, well, not really. I was far more interested in process and dematerialization and inversion and critique and a lot of other things. And so I always used to fire back the two, you know, to say that these buildings are about destruction and ruin was just as stupid as saying that Giacometti's sculptures were about starving people. I mean, they're really not about the same thing at all. And I, but the funny thing that always happens, after something is around a while, it gets sort of approved, fragmentation finally gets approved, so then you have the if you please versions. You have, you know, kind of official architects like Isosaki doing, you know, very sweet versions, you know, textured versions of indeterminacy. And you have, uh, you know, uh, you know, in, in uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, James Sterling in, in Stuttgart, you know, punching a few, a few fragments out of the building. But neither one of them have anything to do with what's going on in the picture at the top. They really don't. And I'm going to talk a little bit about meaning. Uh, this was an early building we did, which, you know, I always observed that, you know, buildings always stand still, people move. And also there's this definition of public art as these objects sitting in public space. I said, wouldn't it be interesting if the people stood still and the building moved, but then as you open the building, it becomes a public space and a public sculpture. So you get three in one. You get movement, you get public space, and you get public art. And uh, so th that kind of just simple th thinking, I always tell students, you know, when you're at a loss for ideas, go back and look at the stupidest idea you can possibly find, something none of your fellow students are looking at because they always figure it's too stupid to look at. And so this is one of those moments, so, you know, why don't buildings move? And actually, the people who designed the movement of this were the same people who designed the lunar rover, the mechanism for the lunar rover. So it's highly sophisticated technology. But it's also, there's, there's difference of understanding. You know, afterward, a lot of corner entries began to appear on, on excellent buildings, on very good buildings. But I always try to point out, there was a difference in motivation, there really was. I mean. In the other examples here, the motivation is far more formal and far more uh, about design architecture. And whereas my motivation was not about that, it really wasn't. It was really about creating art and public space and movement all, all in one. Then we did a whole series, you know, the jigsaw puzzle building, that's again a, a dumbly simple wire buildings always addressed at the same scale. Why don't you allow people to address the building at the scale they feel comfortable with? So you fragment the building and they can and address those scales. And in space, it works fantastically well, especially in the Florida sun. Uh, then, you know, I talked about equilibrium. Uh, people always see buildings uh, in, 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 in sort of, the relationships always seem to be static and the same. And I remember, this was an engineering feat too, because I remember he's telling, my engineers are wildling. I said, okay, we're going to float, you know, thousands of tons of concrete in midair. And he said, well, you can't do that. And I said, well, we're going to do it, and, and we're not going to show it. And they said, well, you can't do that. Well, that immediately pushed the engineering mind to challenge, because they had to figure out a way you can, you can float that much weight in space. And they did a good job. It really worked well. In fact, it was so intensely real. I remember at the opening day, there was this really irate woman who came up to me and said, you, you're the architect? And I, said, I timidly said, yes. And she says, how do you expect me to get up to that entryway? <laughs> so, for, so for her, it had become intensely real. Uh, and then, of course, you know, again, with time and acceptance, uh, you know, there began to be the POMO versions. And, uh, and again, this is with a completely different motivation. I mean, the you know, one by Fuchsas at the, at the bottom, you know, that made it too fancy. Some ideas you don't have to fancy them up. And the same was true with Frank Gehry. I mean, we're tilting buildings and stuff, but you don't have to overdo it. When, you know, you stick to your guns. It's, it's, and, and the worst example was this one very, fairly recently is, which is <clears throat> when you make it too fancy and you destroy the whole weight and balance and <laughs> motivations of the building, then you destroy everything. Then it becomes merely a formal exercise. It doesn't become anything that has nothing to do with that idea. I mean, there's some things when you, when you do it, you want it to be the absolute minimal amount of effort. Never overdo it if you, if you can avoid it. Okay, here's overdoing it. Now, this is because a company said, well, you know, you never show what we do. 
you always, you know, you always just celebrate what we don't do or you criticize what we do do. Because everybody realized these were, you know, humorous critiques of their kind of building. <laughs> so we said, okay, we'll just cut through. And we, <laughs> we cut through. And this was intriguing. We got, we got this sculpture, this amazing sculptor who loved this project. I said, okay, this is going to be two dimensions of time and space. I said, in the inside, it's all going to be the real objects. Said, but as they meet the thermal barrier and they go to the outside, we're going to ghost everything. It's all going to be ghosted. And so you have to cast all of these things. So like hundreds of <laughs> objects, toys and, and pots and pans and everything, this, this amazing sculptor cast. So you see them going through the thermal barrier. You see the real ones on the inside, and then you see the ghost version on the outside. Well, the adults really couldn't figure this one out. They just thought the whole thing was crazy, but children loved it. Did you see this little kid just, the idea of the real and unreal bicycle as simultaneous events. So that's different than inside, outside, like you know, normal architectural interpreters. You're getting two dimensions or three dimensions of the event at the same time. Now, here's another example of, of you know, intervention. I'm not just a Frank Gary kind of intervention on a, on a standard building. Now, the intervention here is obviously the shapes themselves, the shapes and the, and the strength of, uh, and dynamic of sculptural form, whereas our idea was intrinsic to the thing. You just do what's already there. All you do is change it around a little, and you change the meaning. Rather than, you don't so much add sculpture, you just reveal meaning. And the, the one thing that annoyed me the most over the years, this was the most annoying, is after the buildings really became, started to get really famous, uh, people would always send me these things, say, oh, I saw buildings just like one of your buildings. And it was always these gee whiz funny building things. And I just hated them. Because they had not a, even the remotest sense of the word what site was doing. This, these have nothing to do other than that they're cartoons or caricatures of what we were about. And uh, again, just putting at the top of the page, you know, typical sculpture, you know, park, sculpture and park, we were putting art where you least expect to find it. Whereas all the strip across the top is where you expect, you always expect to find public art sitting somewhere, but you don't s expect it to find it in the junk world. Okay, and this is a, actually one of the best descriptions of what we were doing. I'm kind of getting to a point here shifting gears. But this is a very good, good critique of site that came out in Paris a few years ago in a magazine uh, by Leopold Lampere, who said, there is an architectural in invention by James Wines of site created that fascinates me and consists of designing architecture as expected to be, yet this paradigm is being frozen, corrupted, and dramatized in a way that cannot be ignored and therefore questions this paradigm. It's a perfect description. This technique is a perfect architectural adaptation of what the situationists were calling detournement, which I actually believe in, a form of acknowledgement that resistance towards establishment can only be accomplished by the same establishment's <laughs> weapons and pictorial objects, and therefore the hijacking of these weapons in order to flip them back toward their system of production. That was it, uh, that's what I call intelligent writing. And actually, I had an interview today. Whoever interviewed me was brilliantly intelligent. In fact, I'm going to take him around as a, as a guide. Uh, anyway, um, and it's a credit to Columbia where intelligence does prevail, I know. Anyway, I just a picture of the, the world of shopping centers. We, we definitely change people's attitude to that context. And it really was about context. OK, now these are colleagues of mine. And this is a very important period, which every architect should know about. And I'm pushing, you know, either Columbia or MoMA. I, I've been kind of pressuring poor Amal for a while to try to have a major symposium before we all die off of the people who still were part of the kind of Green Street Mafia, as it used to be called, where we all were involved in some element of architecture in an art context, architecture as subject matter. And it was interesting because that period was, was pretty daring. And, you know, everybody got the same kind of critique. And we were all part, I mean, by the, the mainstream architectural scene, you know, architectural record. We were all, they had some kind of pejorative reference, either marginal, alternative, or radical, or outsider, 
or unconventional. I love the one not real architecture, as though there's some omnipotent definition that is architecture. Well, anyway, I guess uh, this, all this whole scene was about taking that away. One extremely interesting artist uh, was uh, Hans Hake, who did critiques of architecture and you know, learned that the, there's a, having a show at the Venice Biennale in the German pavilion and found that Hitler had actually opened the original German pavilion in 1934 at the Venice Biennale. So he did this marvelous destruction of the floor as really a kind of history of Germany. And, and, and as you walked on the floor, you heard this crunching, cracking. And it was one of the most powerful works of public art I've ever seen because it was a critique of the worst aspects of German cultural tradition and also a kind of salvation that it'll never happen again. So the message that you can carry through architecture sometimes are very, very powerful. This is another powerful one by Agnes Dennis, who when they were, you know, threatening to build the World Trade Center, I guess they were building it at that time, uh, planted a wheat field in lower Manhattan. And we were all part of a protest against tall buildings in Manhattan because they were, you know, going to change everything and, you know, increase the lack of scale reference for people and do exactly what they've been doing is, is, is really kind of diminishing the human occupancy or, or the pleasures of human occupancy in the cityscape. So she had this marvelous wheat field going right there at the, at the foot, which again is a commentary on you know, urban versus uh, rural life, life and how they come together. Alice Aycock you know, felt that all her early architectural works were underground. So she felt that, you know, why isn't burial, why isn't the subterranean just as interesting as, the, as what's on the surface? And she also did a series of projects, not only subterranean projects and, and earth-sheltered projects, but labyrinth projects. She just, again, taking architectural issues that, you know, somehow official architecture doesn't embrace and doing. Then, you know, the genius of Gordon Mataclark, and he, we were actually good friends and argued a lot about <coughs> what our roles, because we both love to take apart architecture. You, you know, take all these familiar elements, these, these uh, confirmations you have, and turn them inside out. In his case, he loved to take, you know, archetypes and just dissect them so they have totally meanings. And I love to take archetypes and, and sort of build them up. So, one was tearing them out of his building. And we used to argue, and he always said, well, why do, you, why do you want to do art in those horrible shopping centers? And I said, yeah, I said, of course, that's where the people are. And then I said, well, why do you always want to do it in sort of isolated places? He says, because that's where the people aren't, <laughs> and they need acknowledgment. So we both had the same premise, in a way, in a funny way, but doing the opposite direction. But he you know, did these incredible cuttings through buildings. It completely changed your orientation, your relationship. He did a whole series uh, in, you know, here and abroad, and they, and they were just marvelous because they basically were taking the, 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 the cliches. He studied architecture at Cornell, an uh, experience he apparently detested, and uh, emerged from it and said, well, I spend my life taking this whole thing apart. So that's what he actually did. And one of the most powerful ones is when, the, when they were building the Pompidou Center, he, he wanted to protest against that kind of very auspicious and expensive kind of construction. So his was in a kind of anti-architecture. It was for the, you call it conical intersect. So it's sort of confronted by making a building disappear essentially in front of one that was growing. So again, you had this conflict and dialogue. This is Johnny Pettina who did a series of works in the US, an Italian uh, architect artist. And he took, uh, this was a, just a, house in, I, I think it was, uh, where was it, Utah, and the family were gone for the summer, so he and the students caked the entire house with mud. And I think he lost his teaching tenure there, but, <laughs> but nevertheless, statement was bold, because, you know, the most ecological architecture on Earth is, is Earth, and, er, Earth and, and in another case, water. This was an abandoned school building in, in Minneapolis, and during the Christmas holidays, he and the students sprayed the thing with water for a week and a half, and you know, it became an ice, ice experience. Uh, these are, in a sense, more within the areas of convention, but very powerful. This is a early work by uh, Michael Rotundi, and uh, this was an area completely in, 
industrialized. It was really an industrial area, and so there was a renovation for kind of a remaining historical building there, a house uh, in Los Angeles, and he just brought the industrial elements, the industrial context to the house, and basically consumed it. So that had a very power. This is a part, again, by Vito Acconci. I'll show you the early uh, body works. But again, extending your perception of space. This is a, an amazing show he gave at the uh, Mach Museum in Vienna. And it was certainly one of the greatest shows ever there at that museum. But he took rooms in the museum and just simply changed your whole orientation. He tilted them, changed them, twisted them. This is a beautiful project of his to experience water. It's actually, there's a cafe, it's a whole experience. It's a bridge uh, in Graz in Austria. But as you pass through the whole experience, you realize that here's a bridge that doesn't just cross over water, it engages you in water and it, in, a, in a completely different perceptual way. Uh, this is an amazing artist in, in um, the UK, which I admire enormously, Rachel Whiteread. And hers is, uh, amazing invention is to cast the positive of the negative. So she'll go into a room and cast the room, then bring the content of the room, which is then a solid block of concrete, outside. So you're seeing the positive of the negative as simultaneous events. And for her uh, memorial, Holocaust memorial, it worked incredibly powerfully because she took all the banned books, the books banned by the Nazis and uh, that had anything to do with almost anything, and she made the surface of the building the negative. It was the negative casting uh, positive of all of the books on that shelf. So the entire building is 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 a description of that of that experience in that context. Uh, then we go to the, more to the present. This is certainly one of the most extraordinary projects ever done by the uh, PS1 project. Uh, this is your own Amal and Dan in action. And uh, this project was brilliant because, first of all, it not only occupied the space, it, it, it brought, in a sense, ecological interests, it brought uh, humble materials, it brought everything to a context that really almost had no identity and gained an incredible identity for it. But it also utilized all kinds of devices that are architectural, like clustered columns, which I've always loved because they can diminish or expand volume. So here, here they're using an incredibly inexpensive, you know, found material as a planter for, for life, for, for growth, and then using it in, in, in all different forms of architectural, in an architectural way, in like four or five levels of content within a single work. Here's another brilliant work by somebody who's here, Andres Jacquet. And, uh, you know, this was one, again, one of the best at uh, PS1 which was a uh, filtration system. And the brilliance of this one is when you think of filtration, when you always think of any function of architecture, whether it's air or water or whatever, it's always hidden in the walls or it's, it's, it's never celebrated. Well, here's making the content of the work the celebration of the actual process. So water and the passage of water and the spirit of water and the movement of water and the action of filtering all become the final content of the work. And then finally, this is actually by my daughter. You know, this is you're probably well known to all of you because it's kind of gone global. Uh, she and her partner at um, iBeam Design uh, said that, found out that the, everything to disaster sites is delivered on pallets. Uh, there are 20 million pallets wooden pallets delivered to disaster sites to bring in goods, just like what's happening in Puerto Rico right now. And out of these wasted, dis usually discarded elements, you could build 70,000 dwellings. So they developed these various systems, using them for concrete casting, using them for all different systems of building. So you could literally build permanent residences, long-term housing, everything on, on out of a material. So here's a transformational idea built completely on the recognition of a material that is always wasted. So what becomes always wasted is always used. All right, I'll talk a little bit more about site projects as we'll round it up. This is a very, again, a very controversial project because it's sort of opposed 
you know, the Corbusian dream, the Voisin plan, and the, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway where everybody would be compacted into buildings where they had no identity whatsoever, and including suburbia, you know, where there's absolutely no I identity possible. So we developed the high rise of homes, which is basically a matrix. There's really no, very little involvement by architects. Maybe architect and an engineer just create the matrix. And then it was a kind of a collage project, which you would insert, people would be allowed to insert their own residences, their own identity. So it's sort of the architecture equivalent of what Marcel Duchamp had once called can chance. So you, the, the beauty of the project is waiting for things to happen, hoping for the best, and ho even hoping for the worst. So whatever happened, what happened. And we set up a system uh, for it to happen, so because we knew people would need some help. Um, here, let me stand up a minute. I'm having a hard time. I, I can't sit forever. Oh, stand up a minute here. OK, I think I'm oh, OK, here, yeah. Okay, I'm better now. Anyway, we set up a system of, you know, you go to order up. We're like um, Sears Roebuck houses in the 20s. You, you could order materials, systems, construction methods. You, could, you had a kit of parts, and you could choose whatever you want, including the vegetation. And you could even utilize, you know, buildings being torn down. I always thought it was wasteful to just tear down these nice frames. And here you could sort of insert a certain number of, of, of random houses and vegetation in these buildings. And then this one we, uh, was adaptive reuse. There was a department store in New Jersey, I think it was, where they were gonna tear it down, so we decided to kind of reutilize the frame. It was a use frame, and uh, we just had to utilize it for not only house and garden, but a whole complex. And then this was sort of an idea for every city uh, in the world that was building. And we just to kind of demonstrate identity and density, the power of having your identity while living in the city. And it's certainly better than Trump there's Trump place. Uh, Trump would certainly not, you know, encourage this kind of thing. And this, too, had an influence. But it's strange that everybody was sending me stuff all day, oh, this is just like your project. Well, not really, because it, it, you know, it was really about can chance. And almost all of the other examples are design, design. In other words, they're, 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 they're crafted designs with, with random, seemingly random articulation on the facade. So we've sent a lot of these just likes so that weren't just likes. So I'm just kind of pointing out the differences. Well, public space is something that's always fascinated me a lot. It's something, one of my favorite things to do. And, you know, again, you look at uh, the Embarcadero public space in LA or San Francisco and look at the Trevi Fountain, I think you can certainly see the difference, or even New York City. These are relatively new <coughs> installations of public space in Manhattan. And they basically all come from fascism, because part of the whole fascist idea was that you would build these great slabs, and then you'd build these buildings with the tiny windows, and that meant that the people behind the tiny windows could be watching your every move. So you're under surveillance at all times. So there is a kind of eerie surveillance element and then there's this thing called public art. This is, again, one I don't particularly like because it's quite a beautiful little tabletop collage by Picasso uh, that they blew up to monumental scale with no sense of it wanting to be at monumental scale. I mean, it's there, but it's sort of this thing called public art. And uh, this is, you know, unfortunately, the view of the, one of the great tragedies of all time, but it still was one of the least people-oriented spaces in the world at the World Trade Center, not only the buildings, but the space itself. And this involved what, you know, I unfortunately came to criticize heavily, which is sort of the Henry Moore and the plaza. And, you know, again, having come from Italy where buildings were articulated by messages, complex, you know, religious and civic messages, and to go from that sensibility to the current sensibility, which is dominant. I mean, New York still has these plop art uh, public art things. You know, and I, I, I actually put two phrases into the language. I'm credited on the internet. I wrote an article, I think it was Public Art Private Gallery for Art in America in 1970. And these two phrases, plop art and turd in the plaza, <laughs> appeared. And actually, somebody just sent me the, the picture on the right there is somebody has actually, it said shit, shit, uh, fountain, and it's actually a casting of excrement in bronze, 
and it's mounted in a plaza. So somebody's actually put the turd in the plaza, which is, I guess, a kind of victory. Well, you know, I'm also a professor. I have been a professor, and I talk about public art and public space a lot. And when I teach, this is a kind of a classic that I use when I start a class to show my distaste for this checklist of dreary cliches, as I call it. And I show this to the students right at the beginning. I say, okay, this is going to be architecture and public space, and you're going to, these are all, you're going to try to carry messages with your work, and you're going to work in the public domain. But if I see anything on your computer desktop or your, in your drawings that looks like anything in this picture, you're going to fail the course. <laughs> well, I mean, you can imagine students, the blood drains out of their face. And um, so this is kind of what was behind the ghost parking lot, sort of the opposite of public art. We, Wanted, this is one of our first projects, the idea of making a, a work of public art you could not remove without a total loss of meaning. So you could not take the asphalt off the cars or take them away and put it in a museum because it would have no meaning. The context, unlike the Henry Moore, you put the Henry Moore anywhere, you could not put the ghost parking lot. It had to be in the junk world, and it was made from the fabric of the junk world. And even the process of doing it was a, was a huge success. I mean, there were actually a group of high school kids in the high school next door who didn't know what the hell we were doing. They were beginning to assemble all these old cars. And so they threatened us one day and said, well, we, you know, we're going to come by and we're going to destroy your cars. And they're very, very, very unpleasant kids. And so <laughs> finally, the morning, we started burying the cars. And all the kids came back and they saw us burying the cars. Well, I can't tell you the change of attitude, because every self-respecting vandal knows when they've been outdone. <laughs> so we couldn't have gotten more respect. The kids couldn't have been more help. If I said the word coffee, five kids ran and got me coffee. So anyway, the, the project really did communicate. It, and one thing that it did provide is, is it is like there's only three ways to sit down in New York. I mean, you can sit on a, a little park bench, or you can sit on a block of concrete, or you can sit on a table and chair. But when I lived in Rome, there were like 50 ways to sit on the edge of buildings, on the street, and, you know, in, in the piazza, everywhere there was something to sit on. So pleasing the kids, this is a new way to sit. You know, you, you applied a different seating experience, which I think is more. This is, again, another public space project that sort of came out of this one, because I guess the, the, the Sponsors thought we should do something with automobiles, but this was going to be a history of transportation of the 20th century in Canada. This is what was being proposed. Fortunately, they gave a, gave a competition. We won the competition, fortunately, and then we built this entire artery that really went from all the way, you can see it going all the way from the Vancouver Harbor, all the way, and then breaking off under the highway. So we included all the highways, the public space, the harbor, the boats, the fish, the cars, everything were included in the project. And then it, of course, became a, a good walking space. It, it, it amp they were amplified by the imagery. Every, everybody wanted to occupy this. Set. It was done basically by collecting all these articles, ghosting them like we did in, in one of the early projects I showed you, and then just mounting them on public space, including space capsules and automobiles. And, and then the monochrome gave this is this haunting kind of apocalyptic feeling. So it was sort of the apocalypse of the industrial age. And at the other time, it, it gave this kind of eerie sense of humor. Like, for example, when the high tide went up there, all of the seals in the harbor got on top of the, the, the police car. So we juxtaposed things like killer cars and you know, did, did dust it. But it really was occupied. People really, really, really did occupy it. They, they territorialized this space in a way we'd never seen before. And, and part of the reason was that the background was informational, but it was muted. So the people look better to each other. So one thing about public space we learned, concrete can be very productive as long as the people look good to each other. And then it was used for a lot of performance art pieces, and it looked good at night. So you know, we learned a lot that there's a prosthetic approach. There's something where you the people movement, their actual bodies, the, the engagement of people themselves become part of your project, just as much as concrete or steel or glass or whatever you're building with. And we call these trigger elements. They're unexpected ingredients in the public domain that attract participation, 
encourage invention and, and encourage people really to invent their own games. So when we did a project for uh, children. It's a children's plaza in, in, in Yokohama. And it was on, it's on the other side of the um, uh, railway station, sponsored by a Zuzu car company. So we had a very interesting client. Actually, they sent about a dozen people from Isuzu to New York to describe it, what they wanted. Now, imagine this is what your client tells you. You're all sitting out here. You don't know what to do. You have no idea. You're sitting in the conference room, and, there, and one client is telling, well, I want it to look like a Japanese garden. I love the, you know, the upright stones and the quality of a Japanese garden. <clears throat> and another member of the client said, well, I want it to be like outer space. I want it to be like people are floating in outer space. And then the more pragmatic uh, head of the company said, well, I want to celebrate the Isuzu automobile. <laughs> okay, now here's your, here's your challenge. You've got to be like a Japanese garden, you gotta celebrate outer space, and you gotta celebrate the Isuzu car. So what we did was we turned the entire plaza <laughs> upside down. And these are real people. No, this is, this is Japanese families, which, you know, in Japan, you don't, you know, kind of touch people very often. It's, it's very polite to sort of honor people by keeping your distance. So we had to get Japanese families, or families who were willing to volunteer being cast into, into, uh, fiberglass, and then, you know, we made all of these, this, the plaza level is the level of the wheels of the Isuzu car, and the, and the car maker was delighted because they just uh, arrived at a new transmission, and everybody could see the transmission. <laughs> but it was a very popular plaza. This is kind of when it first opened. We, you know, everything was at ground level. Everything under the feet was ground level, and then the roots of trees and anything underground was, was uh, described accordingly. But this again became activated. People, you know, there was concrete, you know, it was just what I was criticizing before, but it really did activate children. I mean, you know, kids loved it, and uh, for obvious reason. And, and it also, you know, was instructive in terms of cars and people and everything. Well, then the, the Earth Movement began. We started publishing publications, as, as Amal gave me credit for doing early days. I did some Earth Day posters. I'm sorry you can't see the real originals. These were huge posters, and, and the watercolor quality, the kind of splashiness of them was kind of nice. But anyway, I did big watercolors for Earth Day in, in New York and Chicago. <clears throat> and then uh, we started publishing books. We did three in the series, On-Site on Energy. It was really pioneering. It was done by Scribner's in 1974, really when no one was talking about early green, green design or ecological design. So. It was pioneering, but as I always say, this is a book that was bought by five people and my mother. Uh, I, then I, we did de-architecture. That was a little better because at least site had gained you know, a lot of press by then, and so our ideas, however controversial, were at least worth reading. But then I did green architecture for Taschen, and that became, fortunately, one of the best-selling books they ever did. So it was, I think, one of their top 20 books of all time. So obviously the green movement caught them. Even with the late best buildings, we got green. This was built in an area where we weren't going to be allowed to build because it was filled with beautiful oak trees. So we built the building around the trees. And I'd always loved the idea that I saw in, in, in Nature's Revenge, which you would see in, in Italy a lot, especially in Sicily, where the plants and everything would just consume the building. So the idea was to really set up a situation for Nature's Revenge where all of the vegetation would just eventually, you know, consume the space. And this obviously was the most popular building we ever did because people would eat their lunch there. They would, you know, stay all day. And I guess it increased commerce. It was also above and below ground. I always thought that landscape architecture is always on the surface. So why not, since it was on a hillside, why not, you know, make a thermal wall that covers the underground? So it was above and below simultaneously. And again, what is a very popular building. We did a similar building. They wanted a preservation of the landscape in Florida, so we did a kind of a, a again, a landscape building, like a rainforest. It was water and landscape behind the water. So it shimmered. It was really a shimmering building. Now, I got into this idea that you could really make architecture move. And at sunset, it was just like a whole, whole vista in itself. It and a very ephemeral material. It wasn't as aggressive, you know, it wasn't destruction like our supposedly early ones were supposed to be. Well, then we got into this real engagement with the public domain, and we began to get projects that were larger. We did the entire center 
piece of the Seville World Expo, which was all water and vegetation, and it was the main monorail station for the World Expo in Seville. And on one side it was all water, and then it interfaced with vegetation on the other side, and then the monorail station on top. And we had a lot of innovations that, uh, I always said that a lot of these were inno innovative and invisible. A lot of our earlier work was highly visible, so the controversy was the visibility. Here the, the real invention was the invisible. For one thing, the water pre pressure on the glass gave enough static electricity to run the ir irrigation system, and then for the colonnade, this, this was seeded earth inside um, perforated metal. So this is the way it started, and by the time the expo opened, you, you had a completely vegetated environment. You know, it was 25 degrees warmer on outside, so you had a vegetated arcade and places for people to sit. Again, it was, it was people-friendly in terms of the fact that the actual substance, the raw material, water and vegetation, were the architecture. And from that, we learned that you could evolve everything. Intellect, emotion, sight, touch, smell, hearing, atmospheric awareness, everything. And it was in the shape of the Guadalquivir, Guadalquivir River, so it was symbolic in the sense that the ground plan was, in fact, the river. This is another project we did actually in Chattanooga uh, called Ross's Landing. That was the way it looked when we started. They built an aquarium, a freshwater aquarium there. And then they looked at it and said, well, it doesn't look much like Tennessee, it doesn't look like the river. So our assignment was to give it the feeling of the river. The, the, the building didn't provide it, so our, again, this completely came out of the paving. This was a project in which the paving was everything. Everything was the paving or emerged from the paving. Started as the grid of the city, and then as it moved towards the river, it became the configuration of the Tennessee River. And then in the paving itself, we had lots of symbolism. We had the Trail of Tears, we had the beginning of the first American civilization, we, had, we opened up the old canal, we, we sort of broke, to, where we broke up the paving. A lot of the, it was in the paving, the message was in the paving. So the idea of rolling up the paving, we became seeding, it became fountains, it, everything was built essentially out of the paving. And it worked very well. And then for the vertical walls uh, that faced the library and the offices of the aquarium, we had water. So you would see children's movements and everything without the sound in the water all day long. And so, and then down the hill, it became more and more like the river. So, and these are more recent photos. I think it's been totally destroyed. Another landscape architect came in afterwards and rearranged it, and I think they've destroyed quite a bit of it. But the idea was that the project would grow out of the paving and become increasingly vegetated and, and lush in terms of, of landscaping. And then, you know, you kind of walk through water to enter the space. Well, this, this idea that having everything come out of the paving did have an influence. It, has, it was used certainly by Ken Smith in the uh, Water Street and, and, and very much part of uh, James Corner's design for the paving of the uh, High Line. I mean, the High Line is definitely things coming from the paving surface. But we do take credit for a certain pioneering here that happened in Chattanooga. Finally, I'm just coming to the end here. This is just a project that had a disappointing end, but it was something I've always wanted to do, which is gardens in the sky. I always wanted to do sort of a central park in the sky. And it looked like we had the opportunity, the richest family in uh, India, the Ambani family, had a piece of land on Kumbala Hill, which is the crest overlooking the city, a very expensive piece of property. And they wanted to build what they called a residence on it. So we said, well, why don't we build a residence on the top floor and make the building a series of public parks in the sky, what we called a vertiscape. Well, it sounded good at the time, and it also was very much in tune with the history of Hindu architecture in India, which is always layered upward. In other words, you're basically laying not only the structure of the human body, but the structure of the human existence. So you know, you're, you're moving upward through the body, through the spine, and you arrive at the crown of the head, which is, of course, enlightenment. So the spine as a, a down a, a extension of the subconscious moves to the subconscious and thought. So I did a lot of drawings, you know, for this. By the way, I'm the last architect I'm working on Earth who I guess can hand draw. I guess that's all gone, unfortunately. 
<coughs> but I did a lot of hand drawings just to, to try to figure out how this would be done. And one, one of my inventions, to, to which my engineer was proud of me, was the expense of building tall buildings like this, with weight on every floor, in, where you can plant gardens and everything, was the difficulty of building in air. So I thought of this idea of building the central core and then the big truss and then hooking um, the um, cables from the truss so they go down and then you build each floor on the ground level and then you use the, uh, the cables and the truss to hoist them into position. Well, we designed it like that, it was early, and then each of the floors, of course, would be like the vast two principles, uh, which would be earth, water, fire, air, sound, light, and upward to the top. And I did a lot of mood drawings and vision drawings or whatever I thought it would be. We also did a lot of ecological studies, so it would work well in the monsoon season and the windy season and, 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 and the heat absorption, and, re and we designed you know, deflection systems, and and everything for this building. So it was a great deal of work, which it came to a disappointing end because it was, it was that, that was some of the final watercolors I did of the project, different configurations. But then one day I picked up the newspaper and found out that the whole project had been given to a competitive firm that I guess did, was doing it much more expensive. And the whole building became the house of the Ambanis. It became the most expensive House. So the gardens in the sky idea disappeared. Although they, the, the description here of the newspapers used whole chunks of our description, uh, of in the in the actual description of the of what wasn't our project, and then they used an illustration of our project. So it was very disheartening. But you can see there on the on the right is the one that was actually built, and they used, did use the staggered elements, the, the layering, and they used some of the elements from our, our project. But it, it wasn't a total ripoff, but it was certainly in that tradition. And then finally, just on a happy note, we we did recently opened a project in, in Italy. It was an art park for a prominent collector there. But it's up in, near the lake regions, incredibly beautiful, and uh, you see the you know, Swiss Alps from the property. And it's a, it's a big art park, and it's a farm as well. And it, this farm is surrounded by a, by a, a um, fence or, 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 or walls, actually stone and brick walls. <clears throat> so the idea there was to make it as site-specific and as ecological. This is the most ecological building you could possibly imagine because every single thing in the building comes from within a 10-kilometer radius, either torn down buildings or glass made locally. Everything was done right there. And the idea was to take the wall system and you just extend it. So the, the actual building, as you can see from the general plan, is made out of the wall system. Then we developed a module where you would always know you're on the property. That became the columns, the sculpture bases. The, I mean, it, it wandered all over the property as an identity piece in itself. So there you can see it sort of rolling off of the building into the property. And then the idea was to just pick up the piece of land, plant it, replant it, and then just pick up the wall. You see we're just picking up the wall, taking that wall right into the building, integrating it with the building, and going right through the building itself. And the idea ultimately, unfortunately, they're, they're homogenizing it a little bit by there's too much trimming going on, I found out recently. But the idea was that this building would be totally consumed by vegetation, and eventually it would almost become an invisible building. That was the idea. That you would, it's, it's actually a pavilion that's a residence for the curator, but it's also a restaurant and a cafe and a video studio and so forth, underground video. So. And these are just showing how the use of the, uh, of the T-shaped columns and the walls, and inside's the same thing. Because there was a glass company near there, and the views are absolutely magnificent, we thought we wanted never to block the view. So we did kind of a central core of concrete and everything inside is glass and hooked onto the core. So you can see out from every side. And when you come in, you, you get the references. And then this was opening day and you see it's a very pleasant place to be because it's again, it's a little too uh, cultivated in terms of the grass for my taste, but I guess it's comfortable to sit on, so it did include a lot of people. And then the idea of doing site orientation, the idea of designing a building that melts completely in. Here the idea is to recognize the, the monastery in the background, use the site itself, 
and its materials in a totally integrated way. Now, in a way, this is a kind of anti-visual, anti-radical project, but to my way of thinking, invisibility, if you ever ultimately achieve it, is, is a pretty radical pre premise anyway. Anyway, so that sort of ends the project. But one thing I'm encouraged about, just in ending here, is in Documenta 1982, uh, we were involved in that one, and Joseph Boyce, one of my, my really highly respected artists, did an amazing project of these stelae lying around. It's kind of a com commentary on architecture and commentary on the whole scene of you know op ar art objects at a big expo. So in Documenta 14, just opened a little while ago, apparently I almost went bankrupt doing it, but it was very ambitious. But they did a lot of what you would call environmental art, kind of art architecture projects. This is Ai Weiwei doing a kind of fragmented, destroyed building. This is actually a site project of about 25 years ago. We did a building that was components and then you took it away. But anyway, this is a recreation of that. Uh, this is an amazing project by uh, Marta Minjinin. And she did, you know, this is all the banned books of Adolf Hitler. This is a commentary, again, on uh, very much like the Hans Hockey piece I showed you early on, on Germany during its worst period. And it's a Parthenon completely made out of banned books. So it's a very, very impressive work. This is another interesting work uh, by Hiwa Kay, an Iraqi uh, artist. Uh, you know, it's living in, in, in pipes. And since I've been to India a few times, I was very aware of the pipe problem. I mean, they, 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 people uh, in India and a number of the cities, uh, as soon as they put the pipes, uh, irrigation pipes down, they move in like this. And then there's this horrible thing of throwing them out. So, you know, it was a social commentary on the, you know, use of pipes as habitat and then the a rejection of people using pipes as habitat. Uh, this is a powerful project uh, by Ibrahim Mahama, who's a Ghana art artist, and it, he took this building, which is uh, doc, it's, it's called Checkpoint Secondi. He calls it Checkpoint Secondi, and he took this Torwash building, which is a classical building, and wrapped it completely in coal sacks. So you get this very, again, very humble material. This, I'm sure coal sacks in Ghana are a very meaningful, uh, iconic element and wrapped a you know, Western European building in that material. And it became a, a vivid commentary on the two cultures. Uh, this is another cultural statement by Antonio uh, Vega uh, Macatela of Mexico. And it's in the middle of blood, and apparently in the 19th century, uh, slaves were used to power the minting machines in the 19th. So this is a reconstruction of a minting machine, which in the original form was slave-driven. So again, uh, carrying a social message. This is again an, uh, a breeder monument of evolving and missing history. Again, a sort of dematerialization of architecture as materialization. Uh, this is an interesting project. This is a kind of exploration movement. This is, a, you know, I guess a pollution project uh, done by Daniel Kaur from Romania, which he somehow, I hoped it wasn't real pollution, but somehow clouded the tower of one of the documenta buildings with smoke. So it, it disappeared. And if any of you who have been to contemporary China, you know that pollution there is a major problem. It's a major problem around the world. China is doing its best to, to attack it, but a lot of the world is not. So this the idea of fuzzy buildings or fuzzy vision is certainly, again, a powerful iconography of our time. And then last, interestingly enough, Agnes Dennis, who's, I guess, in my age group and still living, did a much more optimistic one for the USA, a living pyramid, which would, I guess would be eventually engulfed completely in vegetation. Well, anyway, and finally, uh, you know, I just want to go back to the 1970s and the early movement of which I was a part. We called it architecture as subject matter, and I think it deserves a lot of credit even today. And also, you know, and just last words to young people tonight. I'm interested, I love this statement by Duchamp. I'm interested in ideas, not mere visual products. And uh, so much of architecture today, you know, is still highly sculptural buildings. I mean, they're iconic. 
started with the TWA terminal in the 60s, and we've gone right well into the future now, with buildings which are really based on sculptural values or sculptural strategies, which were at their peak probably in the 40s and 50s, you know, Max Bill, Henry Moore, and that whole period of organic sculpture, and which then influenced organic architecture. So, in, in a sense, the masters, you know, there's always this issue of trying to imitate the masters. I mean, our magazines are full of buildings that are sculptural triumphs, but probably your generation, I would say that the iconography, I mean, I would say the texture is different here to here. And I, th I think sometimes it's good not to look at the technology in terms of physical elements, as Corbusier did, machines for living in, but to look at the whole world of, of both ecological technology, which is integrative systems, and digital technology, which are integrative systems. So if you just look at this page of images, uh, the last thing in the world that I would think of, I'm not gonna start over now, but that's your job, but I would not think of big, heavy structures. I would think of some other way that buildings could, could take their shape for the future. So this is, again, I'm just opening up questions for you. But I think they were probably done with this kind of public space, I, hopefully. I, I, I hope this can disappear. And, and, and you can reorientate your buildings to the spaces around them so that there's a total contextual experience. I mean, from site's perspective, we made a, a certain contribution to public space, you know, using these, what we call these trigger elements. We, we changed their, people's view towards concrete and a lot, I think. Uh, but you've got a world of your own now, and it's a funny world, because on one hand, we're told that the only form of legitimate communication is the cell phone, and yet that's not always the best way to communicate, as the top right picture indicates. And yet we've got this whole enormous public domain, and, the, and then people who use public space in many different ways. And, 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 you know, just look at the news we have every day now and the depressing lack of communication in the world we probably have as architects and designers and landscape architects a real role. And um, so, you know, I have a kind of an humble perspective from my own. I had a, you know, an humble position in all of this. But one thing I, I really advise is sometimes the simplest things are pretty good. So let's just, let's just start with the paving. That's pretty, and then go from there. Thank you very, very much. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I will. Okay. Well, now you know why I've never lectured at Columbia. <laughs> oh boy. Sorry it was long, but I went. Okay. Oh, definitely chair. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming. Really, I'm, I appreciate, admire, you appreciate audiences. Thank you very, very much for coming, and I. I hope you weren't too bored. I hope it was entertaining as well as got something across. Okay. Uh, I'm Prem Krishnamurthy. Just kidding. <laughs> Prem is on his way back. He, he stepped out for a moment. Uh, I'm Dan Wood. I didn't get an introduction from my wife, but that's all right. Uh, here comes Prem. Um, James, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I, I, I mean, it probably, it, that, you know, the, Columbia could have used that lecture 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, so in a way, it, it, I can't say it was worth the wait, but it, for me, it was worth the wait. That was really, it, it's great. I think, uh, I'm not gonna ask any real questions. I'm just gonna say thank you for that lecture and also that it's, for my, it's amazing that for you, you always say the same things. You know, you're, always, you're very clear. You're always saying the same thing. And yet, and I think it's like with your work as well, you know, for, for you, it's, you're, you're just doing the simplest thing. 
Um, but as an audience member and as a listener and as a fan, of course, um, I'm always hearing different things and experiencing different things and finding different things to think about. Um, and it's, it's, it's just, it's always really inspiring to see how the, in your words, you know, the, the dumbest idea becomes the smartest thing. Uh, so for me, that's, that's, it's really great always to see and to hear you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to people with real questions. <laughs> well, the, uh, it's been an amazing uh, presentation of an ecosystem of things happening. And one of the things that I think is quite amazing is that uh, we've seen uh, architecture as a frame in which its time was shown. And that is something that is very unique. You've been talking of politics, but politics that had nothing to do with surveillance, that had nothing to do with religion or with yeah. uh, fixing ideologies, yeah. but something that somehow is bringing subversion into the familiar. And when we see what happens in these subversions, we see uh, civil rights, we see racial, ten racial tensions, we see LGBTQ realities, we see ecology, we see all these things that have happened in the last decades and that are rarely being shown by architecture. I think there's a political stance here being taken that is surrounded and framed with fun. And in a way, I think this has been uh, an amazing moment in which we've seen how this fun architecture is being political and is inventing the way architecture can be political. Yeah, well, thank you. I, but I know you're interested in this whole territory yourself, to say the least, and as, and as Dan. In fact, that your work says exactly, it, it's the extension of what I, I'm talking about, basically. But I, I, I agree. I, th I, I think the problem with the public domain is you can't really t totally offend people. And you have to, as, as, you know, the Indian temples and the, and the churches of Italy, they still had to take a position, since they're in the public domain, that left a lot to doubt or a lot, left a lot to speculation. You're not quite sure what they mean all the time. I mean, you know, sort of know, I mean, the church obviously operated from a more advantageous perspective because you knew what the church iconography was or what the civic leaders wanted to communicate, so it's more specific. Now it's more ambiguous, you're right. You're, you know, you're, you have to talk about things. Well, as I, as I talked about in, in, in your case, I mean, no one thinks of water filtration. It's the essence of life. We can't, I mean, the entire savage result, really, of, of all of these disasters recently has been the lack of water. So water is the single most important ingredient of all life. Nothing exists without it. And so to celebrate it and at the same time to understand it better is a political statement. I mean, you're making, you know, you're, it is politics, I mean, you know. And, and, and it's also a statement about the whole condition of, of, of this, this ingredients around us. It, it's this one element that we can't, we can't possibly avoid. It, it, and, and so I think that that's one of the things, going back to the dumbest ideas, funny things that everybody's always thought, you know. They, again, I remember when we opened the Houston building, it was very controversial because, you know, at first look, everybody thought this is ridiculous, this is awful. It's like, the, you know, the writers to the architectural record. So, but it was the opening, and you know, it was Texas, for God's sake. You know, so they, they, they weren't exactly the most liberal community. So uh, and I saw this huge Texan coming to me, the big hat and the whole thing. I mean, like out of central casting. And he didn't look happy. And I thought, oh, my God, he's going to beat the shit out of me. You know, he, he hates the building and everything. And so he starts his sentence and says, did you do that? And I said, yeah. He said, <laughs> God, I love it. That's what I've always wanted to do, kick the shit out of one of those buildings. <laughs> so, so in other words, and then I knew I was home free, you know, because you really want to have something happen in your work that, you know, gets people upset, you know. Gets, you know, and, and, uh, and they have to be a little upset uh, or, or they're not going to look at it, you know. They, they have to have something about it that gnaws away. And uh, so I think what you said is very true. I mean, we always had somewhere down there, even, as I say, even if it's invisibility, invisibility can be very annoying, especially when it really takes over. 
If, if invisible architecture takes over, you can imagine how annoying that's going to be. <laughs> so, uh, you know, again, whatever, I, I kind of basically encouraging a young, a young audience here is, is uh, you know, we had a lot of battles along the way. And uh, not the least of which is being un uninvited. But, but um, still, you, you know, you want to listen to people, even old farts like me. I mean, you really... You want to uh, listen because you may get something out of it. There may be something there that you can use. Uh, and it's again why I, I, I am sort of a, now I'm sort of a tour guide at MoMA. Somehow I, I got very friendly with MoMA, both the art and the architecture. So I'm constantly asked to kind of take tours through. So now I'm a docent at MoMA. <laughs> and, uh, but I really realize I'm very knowledgeable. So, you know, I do Frank Lloyd Wright on Monday. <laughs> And I do Rauschenberg. And very few people can do Rauschenberg and Frank Lloyd Wright simultaneously. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, I'm not stupid, that's for sure. And, uh, and um, so talk to older people sometimes. I mean, really, you know, invite them more often. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes they do have something to say. I'm sorry, I, I, I've talked too much tonight. The only thing, I felt, I felt sort of, ill at ease because I really have never been here. So I thought, my God, I, and I have a whole audience who never even heard of sight. So I had, that's why it's got a little long tonight because I filled in gaps. I thought, well, maybe they don't know about this. Or, but I, I will say we did an awful lot more than went on screen tonight. So, you know, you can look up stuff. We did a lot of installation works too. I mean, uh, and as I brought out tonight uh, that Andres and, and Dan's works were as significant as any works they've ever done, even though they are installation. They're not here, but they're in memory, and they'll always be here. As were all of, you know, Alan Capra's whole, you know, herb is missing, but it's etched in granite in the history of art. So, I mean, these are things that, you don't, don't think you have to build a monument every time. You don't, you know, obviously I had a career of very modest scale, modest products, projects. But that doesn't make it insignificant it's just because it's, you know, little. Okay. Well, I think that, that what you said about um, the students learning from this is great. I mean, I, that, that lecture was fantastic. Also because, as you said, Dan, it takes a position. And I thought it was really interesting that you started with people wearing t-shirts that wear their agendas very visibly. You know, what you just said in your comment was the idea of invisible architecture. That would be the worst. An architecture in which, or any condition in which all of the agendas are made so quote unquote neutral that they disappear so that you no longer are aware of the power structure that govern those things. Whereas again, this idea of wearing your agenda on a t-shirt. And I mean, uh, you know, if, if we had a longer time for this, I really wanted to ask you your relationship to religion, because I think that what's interesting is that there is this strong sense of reaction. There is the strong sense of resisting an orthodoxy, but it's also, it's something that I think students obviously do every day. They have teachers that they disagree with, and those teachers that they agree or disagree with give them something against which to push. And it's this basic social impulse. I mean, you talked a lot about the idea of identity and the idea that identity is not something that comes only from the inside. It's obviously made in the juxtaposition with something that defines it. And so, again, that kind of sense of really pushing against something encapsulated even in what the anecdote you gave between you and Gordon Matta Clark. Gordon Matta Clark saying, I want to make things that are in places where there are no people. And you saying, I want to make things where there are lots of people because I want them to have a reaction to it. I want them to push against it. That basic idea of agreement or disagreement, but in any case, that an agenda is made palpable is something that's so powerful about your work. Yeah. That's a, a very good observation, and I agree. Yeah, as a Gordon and I had, had a lot of dialogue, and actually I'm trying to find it now. Uh, so I'm working on the archives at site, and, and, and Mark Wigley and I had dinner together, and he's writing a, a, a work on, on Gordon's work now. Uh, but it is interesting because, in a, in a funny way, we both ended up with nothing but photographs because I, I worked in a junk world that's completely destroyed because the next developer comes in, and he worked in a fragile world where the only, the only images left are photographs, really. 
But they both have, have resonance because you, you, you say, you, you made a very, very cognizant and, and a perceptive statement because they both exist because it doesn't matter whether they're in photographs or, 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 or visitation, they're about something. They're about the fact that people live in anonymous places, have anonymous lives, are never recognized, and the only way you can bring a little you know, suburban house to life is to elevate it with art. You know? And I used to say that his, his works were, you know, preser because they, once they became art, you had to keep them around, kind of. That was at least the implication. And it was sort of preservation by demolition. That was the, the nature of his work. So, uh, and I think that, uh, again, that the only thing I would encourage students to have, if you want to have an interesting life, is, is you know, get into something, you know, believe something, you know, get into an investigation that's, that you can keep doing. You can, you can keep on moving it around. You can adjust it. And because all art grows out of other art. Everything in the world grows out of other art. It's just a degree of thought and originality brought to the cause. You know, I, I really do credit, I mean, Dan's heard this story. Dan and Amal, we know each other well, they heard this story many times. But my career did start with Museum of Modern Art because Emilio Ambas was encouraging art director to go see sight. So he said, well, let me see the work. Well, he immediately saw the work. He, he hated it. He said, that's not architecture. You know, I'm not going to go see the people like that. So Emilio prevailed and finally persuaded. So Arthur Drexler called me on the phone and said, OK, I'm coming down to see you, but I've got an hour. So just everything you're going to tell me, you have to tell me in one hour. That's all I've got. So we came down. We started talking. And you know, I knew he was a Miesian scholar, so we started talking about Mies van der Rohe. Well, I mean, you know, two hours later, we were still talking about Mies van der Rohe. And then he stopped in mid-sentence and said, my God, James, you really know a lot about Mies van der Rohe. How can you possibly like Mies van der Rohe and do what you do? And I said, because Mies van der Rohe did it so well. It doesn't have to be done again. And, and I said, that's why I try to do something else. I just, you know, I have to have my own identity somewhere here. So after that, we got talking. And then Arthur Drexler stayed in my studio for three days. He came for three days in a row. And that, and it, it go to show one thing, that if you have something you want to say, you can say it. You know, just push towards it. You know, really just push towards it. Because you really do have to fight. You know, I, I said it humorously in the beginning. Yeah, but it really is true. I mean, I, I've been on these lecture committees. And, the, and if somebody's targeted as the enemy, uh, they'll never be brought to your attention. So you're going to miss huge chunks of art history or ideas or something simply because one person on your committee is protecting your delicate sensibilities. And certainly as students, you need to be exposed to everything you can possibly swallow. And I would certainly look at visual art. I would certainly look at theater. I would certainly look at performance. Uh, and if anyone tells you that, oh, well, that's n n not real or that's not good art or whatever. And I always, you know, hasten to remind everybody of the statements by Clement Greenberg, the, the, the icon critic of abstract expressionism, who made these statements that abstract art is here forever. The human figure will never appear in art again. <laughs> well, that was followed by pop art. <coughs> so, I mean, any time you hear a statement like any kind of absolute or that person doesn't know anything, or everything James Wine says is a crock of shit, just ask yourself, well, let me check it out if you see if it's really true. <laughs> just, I'll check that out before I, I make that decision. Should we move on? Yeah. yeah um, okay, we're going to open it up for questions. Not only does James know a lot about Mies van der Rohe, he also went on tour, lecture tour with Louis Kahn, which I think <laughs> is always an amazing <laughs> fact. <laughs> So, uh, <clears throat> hi, uh, thank you for your lecture, James. It was uh, really wonderful. I, I feel like this is a life-changing moment for me. Um, I recently had a chance to spend some time with Stanley Tigerman. And <clears throat> it was, it was, I think one of the things that was amazing was just now, as you're mentioning Mies, he claimed to be the only true Miesian, um, Stanley says, Tigerman. Um, and I think, you know, from knowing his work and, and now sitting in a room and, and witnessing uh, 
uh, your work. I'm wondering about uh, a kind of maybe, I, I don't I hesitate to use the word generational, but some kind of a generational relationship with the word irony. Uh, if I were to use the word irony from, a, from the standpoint of a Greek tragedy or as a rhetorical device, um, I, you know, when I see your work, it, it's definitely, a, a, was on, on the one hand, a self-aware resistance to, as Pran mentioned, uh, a, a kind of uh, orthodoxy that you want to resist. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the effectiveness of the rhetorical device is independent of the uh, content that's constructed. And therefore, whether or not it looks like Mies, it may very well be Mies. Uh, in, in that sense. So I'm really curious, especially, you know, Andres uh, being, being there on the panel, I am also curious about Andres' relationship with irony, too, uh, given maybe a couple of generations apart. Well, yeah, I guess I do have an ironic sense. I mean, I look at life with a certain sense of humor. Uh, and, and humor, obviously, I, you know, I, people always say, oh, you're the architect who puts humor into architecture. Um, yeah, there had been a humor in architecture, as I showed in the beginning, a, a, lo a long time before in many forms. But no, I think irony is just, again, another device. Uh, you know, some of my, well, Duchamp was all about irony. So, I mean, some of the people I admire most have that ironic edge in their work. It's just something that appears there. Others don't. I mean, it is, it is interesting that uh, you mentioned that Lou Kahn and I were great friends. And that actually, I found it very interesting that uh, I remember Bob Venturi really, really respected it profoundly. And, and they never quite, I felt, clicked. And for some reason, Lou Kahn and I clicked. We talked together at, at Penn. And he just, from the first day, we started talking. And I think because we, again, we talked about ideas, and I was very ironic. Everything I was thinking of then was pretty much about irony or critique. And he was, you know, very idealistic and very driven to, to great ideas. And, and I profoundly, to this day, admire what he did. But I also admire, you know, so many great ironists, too, you know. I, I really think about it in literature, in art, or anything. So it's again kind of what I was saying at the beginning. I mean, we have to, we admire whatever the intent was. And I, I think that was the, the success of my meeting with Arthur Drexler. He finally said, my God, this guy has a different intent. Why is his intent any less valid than anyone else's? Let's see what he does with it. So I think that that's part of the thing. I, I never quite get rid of my ironic edge because mm -hmm. I almost see everything as, as the other side, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, even I've got Harvey Wein, Weinstein. I mean, <laughs> Harvey's going to be resurrected in six months because the whole business, he's a genius at what he does. So the whole business is going to start sliding into the abyss and they're going to find some weird, you know, weak excuse to resurrect him. And uh, actually, we were talking with a driver coming up here, and, and, and the dialogue I was having before we got to the dialogue tonight, on if you really look at all the great accomplishments of history, I can't think of one that had a nice person behind it. My God, I mean, <laughs> Lorenzo de' Medici, he was an asshole. I mean, he was the worst. But he, there's the Renaissance. You know, he patronized good stuff. And so we have to, you know, strike some humorous, ironic balance. Uh, you, you know, women are brilliant and had, had all kinds of defenses against Harvey just by sheer irony. They could have, you know, shoved him into the abyss of, of remiss and, 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 you know, get rid of the guy or get rid of the moment, you know. I mean, there are all kinds of ways we have. But I do, I do value having a sense of humor at the core as something that makes life livable. And, I, and, and architecture should be one of it. Some of it is just too serious for its own good, to the point it really doesn't, isn't very interesting very long, because it doesn't have that ambiguity. I mean, look at Oscar Wilde. That's all irony. And the longevity, I mean, if I've seeing the importance of being earnest, what, 200 times? And does it ever grow thin? No. I mean, not that kind of writing. 
So I think that, uh, you know, we have to look at, you have to understand what you're looking at. Uh, go ahead. You want to ask about that? We'll take one more question and then uh, if anyone, everyone would like to join us in the cafe for a reception, we can continue the conversation there. Sorry, I didn't really mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to <laughs> uh, ask a question about what you just said, which is understanding what you're looking at because your work is like incredibly uh, su sublimated in like these layers of meaning and, um, and all these abstract ideas, I think, that come into it. Um, but it's also really, really visual and in a way kind of, as you say, kind of dumb. Um, and so I wondered how uh, you see, what's the, what's the role of kind of the visual reference in, especially in public space, let's say? Well, aesthetics are really important. It's funny how, how important they really are. Um, Vito Conchi and I used to love going to this Chinese restaurant, which had the worst decor on earth. It was so bad that you just couldn't believe that anything we did. It had 35 architectural styles in one room. And we, yet every time I brought Vito there, he would go and inspect every corner. And then we'd come back to the table and we'd commiserate, you know? It's really good and we couldn't possibly do it because if we tried to do it, we'd artify it. We'd try to make something aesthetic out of it and that would ruin it because the utter banality of it, the, the vulgarity of it, the juxtaposition of things that don't go together. As an artist, you just can't think of it. So in a funny way, I always I feel this question of aesthetic is sort of, you know, I'm good at it, obviously, but on the other hand, it's sort of a, you know, both a crutch and, and a, an inhibition to have it because you can't do everything you can't go beyond your own taste in a way. It's very difficult um, to, well, uh, Duchamp had that famous statement, you know, I spent my, my life trying to avoid conforming to my own taste. <laughs> and it's a powerful statement because you know, it's really hard to do. And I draw really well and I'm, you know, sort of Renaissance personality kind of in my head anyway. I sort of live in those kind of art, around his times in, in my, this is my brain. So it's very hard for me to release it. I, it you, you, can, you do something, but you're, it's always aesthetic. I mean, I don't think you know, anybody would complain that finally when you look at something even 20 years later, it may have been controversial in the beginning, but usually it's just the content. <coughs> and it's not the aesthetic. It's not you know, the, how it looks visually, really, that you're it upset you, it's, it's usually some message that you didn't like or something like that. I mean, does that answer your question? I don't know if this is a good answer, but. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jim.